Thank you for listening to A Glimpse of the Kingdom. A Glimpse of the Kingdom can remain free because of generous donors like you. If you'd like to donate, feel free to do so online, or you can send payments through Facebook Messenger. Don't forget to tell your friends about it so that they can enjoy this ministry as well. Be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any podcasts. You can listen to my daddy every single day, like in the gym, in the car, or just at home. Glimpse of the Kingdom is awesome! If you're a Christian, and I bet most of you here in this room are, maybe not, it's a question I think, I, I hope that you will always ponder, that is, why are you a Christian? My hope and prayer is that you will be able to give a short elevator talk to answer that question. And why do I say that? Because we're Christians, we ought to have something to say about it. There's all kinds of biblical examples, and one, of course, is straight from 1 Peter 3.15. They were talking to Christians in a Roman and Greek world that were pagans, and this new fangled religion, Christianity, was out there, and he encouraged them, have something to say. They say you're a Christian, have something to say. And as I've said many times in sermons and talks, please say something more because I just am, or <laughs> because my parents are, or because... I'm an American, or because I'm white, or male, or female. I mean, some silly, silly reason. Try to give some kind of reason. I was talking to someone the day about this, and uh, and he or she was saying how difficult it is to say it. And I said, "You're right," which is why you ought to practice it. Now's the time. Practice it. It took me a long time, and the, the one time I got real good at it was when I wrote my book. It was. It took me a long time. Was, how can I say it? I got it down to three sentences. And then when I discovered that's my top like thesis statement, I can say it in three sentences. And if they ask me any questions about any of those things I bring up, well, then I can unpack those. The degree to which you can unpack all of your sentences, that's up to you. It's up to your maturity level. It's up to your education, up to your interest level. Everyone doesn't have to answer the question the same way. But try to say something. And ideally, if I were you, at some level, some of these words like this ought to come out of your mouth. I'm a Christian because I think Christianity is true. At some level, we ought to say those words. And then they're going to say, why do you think it's true? That's a good question. Here's why. Does that make sense? Because that way it's based on truth claims, not, I just feel like it. And we'll talk a lot about that later on. But I do want you to ponder this whole time. If you are a Christian, how would you answer that question? How would you answer that question? Now, why would you talk about this stuff? There's a big need to be clear about giving a reason. Youth abandon the faith. Three different independent studies demonstrate that seven out of ten high school students leave the church when they graduate. Seven out of ten. And about three to four will come back. So that's roughly three to four out of every ten youth in American churches will never come back to a church, which means statistically they leave the faith. And the top, of course, two reasons why are they, they usually feel they have to choose between science and religion, which is absolute nonsense. And the second reason is because they have friends who believe different things, and they think, I can't tell my friend they're going to hell because he's so nice, she's so sweet. So that's called pluralism. And if you want some, the first one about science and religion, we're going to talk a lot about. The second one, if you would get to that topic, we can if you want to, but it's not. They, they get bombarded with that. The so-called nuns, that is the religiously unaffiliated, that's the second largest religious group in North America and most of Europe. They make up about a quarter of the population. Let that sink in. What is a nun? That's what I do. People who have no nun affiliation, religious affiliation. So they ask them, what's a religion? Do you have any, you know, are you Orthodox, Protestant, Catholic, or that kind of, or do you have or Hindu, Buddhist, Jew? or none, no religious, and the, and the nuns are rising. Now, it's not just because people then become atheists. A lot of the nuns are people who call themselves spiritual, but they don't claim allegiance to a particular religion. So spirituality has arisen where denominationalism is going down. So it's not to say that atheism is necessarily on the rise, but it's a close to it. Because when you start saying I'm spiritual, they don't really mean anything that we would call by anything religious. Do they uh -huh. believe in God? Do they believe in God? 
No, do they believe in God? Do they believe in God? Well, yeah. they, they, the nuns can say they believe in God. They would define it very vague. Oprah's God, a cosmic battery source, the force be with you kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. A higher power, the universe. But not God or Jesus. But not monotheism. Not God the Father, Son, or Spirit. No. Yes, ma'am. be a Christian and not be affiliated with a particular denomination, correct? So can you be a Christian and not affiliated with a particular denomination? Absolutely. But I'm not aware. Right. So right, denominationalism is not the nuns. This means they don't affiliate with a religion. So you affiliate with Christianity. They say, I only affiliate with a religion. That's a good question. Not a denomination. Yeah, but not a religion. Yeah. Yeah, within real, in Christianity, denominationalism is also in the major decline. That's why non-denominational churches are booming. That is, in our generation, mine, and I'm, I'm 40, mine and basically my generation was the first one to start not really caring about which denomination you go to. Studies demonstrate that. I mean, there's some I wouldn't want to be involved with. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, care. The other reason why there's a big need to be prepared to talk about it is there's an enormous amount of evangelistic, you might say, Propaganda from atheists. If you don't know that, let me be the first to declare it. It is everywhere. Books are written, top-selling, best-selling books. Um, retreats, camps, panel discussions, debates, lectures. They've done a tour in the United States and in Europe, too, where Richard Dawkins and others went around to unbaptized people, people who wanted to who rescind their baptismal waters. It is overwhelmingly out there. YouTube produces an enormous amount, not YouTube, but people put on YouTube, an enormous amount of atheistic literature. So there is all kinds of material out there. And just because your world might not be encountering a lot of atheists, I understand that. But I'm telling you, you're rubbing shoulders at the grocery store, the gas station, everywhere with people who are watching that material. Yeah. Like I someone who will not want to take away something, don't believe yeah. in the first place. Yeah. It makes them real happy to see people deconvert. It makes them real happy. It does. And the last need I would say is the existence of God is the greatest conceivable question. I mean, think about that for a second. And people like Christopher Hitchens and others like or Dawkins, it's just it's a petty, stupid question. That's ridiculous. Think about that. If there is, I mean just really, just if there is an all powerful creator of the universe, designer of everything. If it's conceivable there is that kind of being, and secondly, if it's conceivable that kind of being has communicated with humans, that's a big deal. On a minor scale, if this place, I went down to, I turned this place into this court and then had some hoops, and then I had lines and I came up and we all grew up on this place and I realized, I go, Look, we found these bouncy things, and we start bouncing. And some people think the way, well, we'll make up a game where I, I throw it at you and tag you. Some people do it. They throw it all around their body. Some people roll on the ground. Some people bounce it. Some people just throw it like a football. And someone said, hey, I heard a rumor. I heard a rumor there's a, there's a guy who actually designed the game. This is a game, and he designed it. That's just stupid. What a stupid question to even ask if there's a designer of the game. That's not stupid. Did you come to find out this is called basketball? There's a person who actually designed the game. Would it matter at all that someone, there's, there's rules to this. There's a purpose. If you'd, it would make a difference. And that's a small little analogy. But if, the, if there's a creator of the universe, there's nothing more important than that. And the greatest thinkers forever, even atheist thinkers, Nietzsche and on and on, the, Sartre, these people knew it, the greatest conceivable question was, is there a God or not? So there's a big need to think about the answer to the question, why are you one if you are a Christian? Yeah. That's gotcha. It's called, that's a kind of minor version of what's called Pascal's Wager. So you'd rather be wrong if there is no God than be wrong that there is a God and you said you didn't believe in him. Yeah, I, I believe in God because in my heart I know he's there. But if I'm wrong and there really isn't a God, then, you know, when I die, I'll find out. Yeah. Pascal's wager said the same thing. Would, is it worth it spending an entire lifetime? If you're wrong, what difference? You would have done good for other people. You would have felt there's a purpose. You would have felt happier and all this stuff. Maybe you're wrong, so what? Pascal wager said, but if you're right, you got both hands. But I've seen things in my life that convinces me that good. he's there too. So you see things that have convinced you. Good. Yeah. And as we go on, I want you to keep thinking about the things that have convinced you. Convinced you. So before I give reasons about... Um, 
Christianity some preliminary remarks. So these are things very quickly I'm going to go through pretty quickly. One is uh, this presentation won't appeal to everyone's situation and need. Like I said before, um, not everyone needs all this information. I know that. Some of you are living in the retirement community. Some of you are working in a cubicle. Some of you work from home. <laughs> there's a restaurant business. I mean, I get it. A library. There's all kinds of different walks of life. Not everyone's going to need all this information. That's okay. Not everyone in this room is often around skeptics and atheists. That's okay, too. But you are surrounded by people who are like that. And secondly, you yourself might have doubts and questions from time to time. And this material can really encourage you. So please don't stop coming just because that little bit doesn't really appeal to what I need right now. You don't know what you will need. God can use the material you learn tomorrow or a year from now and you go, man, we covered that exact question. I don't remember, but I have notes. Uh, that'll be good for you. And, and of course, number two, I can't make you believe something. Prove by any dictionary means to prove. Demonstrate the truth or existence of something by evidence or argument. Demonstrate the truth or existence of something by evidence or argument. We can attempt to prove that Christianity is true. I can attempt that. But no matter what we do, we can't make a person believe something. That is to say, I can't make any of you, and I can't make an atheist, come to the declaration, you did it, that proved it to me. I can't make that happen. If I said, believe there was a pink elephant in the room, but what would I do to make you believe that? There's nothing I can say or do, no special dance, no incantation. I can't make you believe that. I can't make you find something convincing. Convincing is a psychological or mental state to be convinced. That depends on whether or not the person is willing to be convinced, what type of evidence they're looking for, whether or not you present enough evidence, and so forth. What I can do is tell you why I know Christianity is true. That is, what evidence proved Christianity is true to me. People can be brainwashed. Give, no. People can be what? Brainwashed. Yeah, brainwashed, conditioned. Sure, they can be. And I can too, which is why, and I'll, I'll admit all that in a little bit. Um, and so I can't make a person believe something. Now, right, if I took you off to a camp and waterboarded you and showed you pictures and gave you poison and chemicals and heroin, and I said, okay, come out and go, okay, I'm a Christian, I believe. Well, that's not going to happen this, this month. Next year, I might do that just to <laughs> see if it works. Just a joke. But I can't make you do that. In fact, I don't want to make you do that because I'm a Christian. Not only is that immoral, too, that's not how relationships work. It's like wanting to make you believe my wife is great and awesome and loving. I don't want to make you believe that. That's not how we're, I don't want to make you believe that about me. So I can't make it. What I'm trying to say that I'm trying to encourage you, if you're a Christian talking to a non-Christian, I'm encouraging because one of the number one things I hear from people why they don't talk about Jesus is they're scared to death they won't have the thing to say when they ask that question. What do I say when? And I don't know how to make them. You don't have to make them at all. So give up. Throw your hands up. I'm not, I can't make you believe anything. It's just that if someone asks you you're a Christian and you talk about it, you want to be able to say why you are one. But if they go, I don't find anything you said convincing, you go, okay, that's between them and God. It's between you and God, you and God whether you did the best job you could to defend your faith. But God can use anybody for anything, including our profound ignorance, but I can't make you believe something. So that's not my goal here. My goal is to present like in a courtroom, the best evidence I know. And I'll go back to that in a second. Three, I can know something without being certain. And this is one of the most common arguments by atheists make against Christians. You Christians, are, you think you know everything. You're so certain. Well, some Christians might talk that way. I do not. And another thing atheists say is Christians are so certain when there's no evidence. Well, we'll talk about evidence later on. We use the word think in American English when we're like over 51%. I think it's going to rain tomorrow. I think the appointment's at seven. We use no when we're like over three quarters, we think about it. Yeah, I know, I know it. We use certain or sure when we're like 100% sure, most of the time, if that makes sense. Uh, I know Christianity is true. I know it. I'm not certain it's true. Philosophically speaking, I'm not certain of anything. I'm not certain you exist. When you know something to be true, a comfortable feeling, okay. Most people use in a sense of, I've, I have intellectual assent. That is, I grasp that the truth claim is so true, I could use the word know. That's the verb. Of course, the noun would be knowledge. I have knowledge of. And most people don't use the word know when they use the word believe. They don't. What I just said. So when I say I believe the meeting's at 7, 
or I think it's at seven, that you show some kind of uncertainty. Uncertainty. We use the word no, it means we're much more sure. But we're not 100% sure. But here's my point. No doesn't mean be certain about. That's not what no means. Instead, I know something when it's very probable. I know I'm married. I know that I exist. I know that I have children. I know that Disney World is God's favorite park and that Christianity is true. I know that God eats a Cracker Barrel. I mean, who doesn't know that? Who, what would you say when there's no doubt it's, it's a positive fact that can't be denied? It's a fact. What would I say when something's a fact I believe it. I mean, and I believe it? Fact. I would say I know that's a fact. I mean, when you say there's no doubt, which means yeah. there's no way there could be a doubt, that's certain. So you're saying God, what God says are facts are true no matter what. He's infallible. He's infallible. infallible. Right. And I, only because of time, maybe afterwards we can chat. That's, that's one thing to say what you're saying is that's true about God. Then the question, what I'm talking about now is do you believe that's true? Do you know that's true? Or are you certain that's true? Those are different categories based, okay, based on your mental state. But I'm saying in philosophy, we use the word certain and sure almost never. Outside like geometrical proofs of triangles and so forth, most people don't use the word sure ever. In common vocabulary, are you sure Elaine's coming? Yeah, I'm sure. And what I mean is, yeah, she told me and I trust her. But maybe she died in a car wreck. Maybe she just forgot the meeting. Maybe whatever. But I can use it that way. But technically speaking, if someone said, are you sure you're sure? She's coming to dinner. I go, well, no, I'm not. I'm not certain. But I would say, but I know it. I very strongly, strongly believe it. That's how it is with Christianity. So the reason why I called this study, Christianity, Why I Know It's True, was on purpose. I didn't say why I'm certain it's true. I said why I know it's true. I use it, this, and I'm saying, this. let this sink in, is that for me, it is beyond the sense of I just think it. I put it in the same category of knowledge of I'm married. I know I'm married. I know Christianity is true. It's a form of knowledge. Um, and it may not be that for you, but it is for me, and that's why I use the exact vocabulary in the title, I, why I know it's true. It doesn't mean I'm certain. Yes, ma'am. I was just going to say over there. Maybe so. So you're saying your goal is to make sure people aren't, not to prove it to them, but maybe give them a question to test their certainty. Yeah. That, that could be the case. Uh, can I, I'm sorry. Can, can you hold afterwards? Is that okay? I'm sorry. Because I'm going to run out of time. Let me, let me wrap this up real quickly because this is just preliminary remarks. We haven't got to the actual meat yet. I want to make sure we get to the meat as quickly as we can. Um, number four is nothing I say will be a knockdown argument to silence critics. That's not how this works. For example, if this were a debate and there were an atheist sitting right here, I'm just using the word, we'll talk about that in a second, it's a generality. Um, they would, he or she would always have something to say in response to everything I'm going to tell you. None of these things would make a person go, I've never considered that ever. If they're an educated skeptic, they're going to have a, well, you could say story. You could say. So that's not how this works. So it's a little bit unfair in the whole debate because I'm the only one speaking. But that's what happens when you're a pastor of church. I mean, I didn't ask for someone to debate for the next six weeks. Instead, I'm just presenting it. But what I'm doing, in all fairness, most of the time in your handouts, I give you literature that has a different point of view. So you can read atheist all you want. Um, but all that to say, nothing I will say. So what matters is whether what the skeptic says, listen, compels you to believe. That's why it's like a courtroom. In a courtroom, the prosecuting and defending attorney, they look at the exact same evidence but come to different conclusion on what it best explains the data. That's exactly what I'm doing. I'm one side in a courtroom making a case. And nobody in the courtroom, no d lawyer thinks, the other lawyer would go, hey, I rest. I don't know what to say. I, you know, I, I prepared for months. There's nothing to say to anything he just said. That's nonsense. They're going to say something to win their case. Well, so will I. Um, so there you go. All I'm saying is I, I fully grasp nothing will be a knockdown argument that silence critics. What I'm concerned about is to give to you what I find most convincing, like in a courtroom. I'll always speak in generalities. Okay, I will almost speak. That was kind of funny. I'll almost always speak in generalities, uh, but I have to. And you might be frustrated. Like when I say atheists often say, well, that's not, I mean, that's a big fat mouthful to say atheists. There's all kinds of atheists and all kinds of atheists in literature. I know that. I know that. But I, I have to do this to keep the study going all the time versus quoting, con and I thought about that in the study, having billions of quotes from various atheists to hear from the horse's mouth. It's just going to get too cumbersome. Uh, so when I say atheists say it's based on my research and personal experience, which is limited. 
but it's widely enough to be generally true. And if you're an atheist watching this or listening to this or you talk to a person and say, I think atheists say, we don't mean offense. I'm not trying to be offensive by speaking in generalities. No more than atheists say, Christians believe. I want to go, well, I don't believe that, but I understand I have to speak in generalities. And the sec last thing is, I'm simply not omniscient. I don't know everything. I'm fine with that. I'm just okay with that. Same thing with you. I encourage you if you talk to an atheist and you go, I've never thought about my entire life. I don't know. Uh, we're going to cover a lot of ground, but I, I don't know everything. And if you ever have a question or comments of which I'm ignorant, which happens often, I'll go, I don't know. Go try to find some research for you, but I don't know everything. I'm not going to pretend to know everything. And that's okay. Cool? So here's some quick terms. I want us to make sure we cover these things tonight. So let's get into this. Um, atheism. Atheism. If someone asks the question, is there a God? There are only two possible direct answers to this question. <laughs> is there a God? The answer is either going to be what? Yes or no. Yes or no. That's it. There's, it's either yes or no. Now, however simple that seems, I'm telling you it's not today in the conversations. If you say yes, you're a theist or a deist. If you say no, you're an atheist. But what atheists now you just say things like is, I don't know, I don't care. An affirmative answer has never been established. The question is meaningless. These, these are not answers to the question. Forever, atheism was defined as someone who holds to the proposition, no God exists. Someone who holds to the proposition, no God exists. And that should be what the definition is because a theism means no God in Greek. The alpha primitive means a, ah, which means you, it negates the no. Theism for God. It means literally no God. It doesn't mean I don't believe in God. It means no God exists. Does that make sense? Forever, in every dictionary, forever. That's what it meant. Someone who holds the proposition, no. Do you believe God exists? No. That's a propositional statement. But what happened about... Good heavens, now it was 40 or 50 years ago. Uh, a guy named Antony Flew, who was the most well-known philosopher atheist, who actually converted on close before he died. That's a big blow for atheism. He defined atheism as a psychological state. He defined atheism as the lack of belief in God. I don't believe in God. When you say you don't believe in God, stay with me, you've moved from a proposition, no God exists, to a psychological state. I don't believe in God. Well, that doesn't answer the question. And then they'll make up other things like, well, there's a strong form of atheism, I know God doesn't exist, and a weak form of atheism, I don't believe in God. But what's happened now is almost all atheists have changed the definition to mean, I don't believe in God. Well, that's not a claim. Now, why would you do that? Because of Antony Flew, probably, but the main reason is because it's an attempt to shift the burden of proof. One of the number one things I get on my Twitter feed all the time is, is you Christians have the burden of proof. Now what that means is, whenever someone makes a propositional claim, they bear the burden of explaining why that's true. That's completely true. <laughs> David, are you married? Yes, prove it. You bear the burden of proof because you said you're married. That's true, that's right. Well, okay, well after here's a marriage certificate, Made a claim. Absolutely, I made a claim. Atheism forever was also a claim. No God exists. Prove it. You can't prove a negative. Of course you can. It happens all the time in courtrooms. I was. Did you murder that person? No. Prove it. I wasn't there. I was at home asleep. Do you have any witnesses? Yeah. My wife was sitting in the bed beside me. And so my kids. I tucked them into bed. That's how I prove I wasn't there. I'm proving a negative. Proof Santa's not there. That's easy. No one lives in the North Pole, dummy. There are no elves. Well, they're invisible. That's not Santa Claus. The myth is not that. In other words, you can make up stories, but everyone thinks that. So what's happened is when you meet a normal person out on the normal street who says, I'm an atheist, I'm telling you, 
you can always ask them, uh, do you believe in God? And they might say, I don't believe in God or whatever. My one little tip is don't get into, it's called legomachy, a word war. Are you an atheist or not? Are you agnostic? What, what's the word? Because they're going to go around and around and around about it. Atheism just means I don't believe in God. You're the one that believes in him. You've got to prove it. I don't prove anything. Even if that were the definition, I still think that's dumb. If someone said, um, if someone said, uh, I'm still new to Lawrence, someone said, there's a town, there's a town to the west called Topeka, and I go, I don't believe you. And you, and you said, we mean don't believe. So I don't believe Topeka exists. I, I just don't believe in Topeka. If someone said, why don't you believe Topeka exists? I don't have to say, I don't, one more word, I just don't believe. I don't owe you any explanation of my lack of belief. I just don't believe it. You might go, okay, whatever, crazy person. That I mean, <laughs> In other words, even someone says, I don't believe, it's a fair question to go, why don't you believe in Topeka? Would it matter that I've been there, I was born there, I went to school, or whatever it is? I don't believe it, I just don't believe it. But my point is, lack of belief is still what, it's okay to ask the question. But what I typically don't do, atheist, is debate how to define the term. I'm telling you because if you read literature that knows what they're talking about, forever atheism was used in a technical sense of a proposition. But today with low-level atheists like Richard Dawkins and others, they've changed it to the psychological state. I just don't believe in a God. So I would always ask them, the, the, what do you, what's a word for a person who thinks God doesn't exist? There's no word for that anymore. Mm -hmm. Someone that says, I don't believe in God, I believe in a higher power. They believe in a higher power. Somebody created it. Whenever someone ever, in a conversation, and I could say several things, but quickly, whenever someone makes a claim about anything, I don't believe in God, but I believe in a higher power, I always ask, oh, okay, why is that? Because they've made a claim. Why is that? What I don't do is go, well, that's not true because I don't ever attack them or go on the defensive. I'm genuinely interested in the answer to my question. Why is that? What well, makes you lead you to that question, if that makes sense? I want to start a dialogue. In a conversation with people, especially when the, about faith issues, I spend way more time asking questions than I ever do saying anything. Way more time asking questions. And that's on purpose. I want to hear what they have to say and show them that I care because I do care. And a lot of people have such a horrible image of Christians, a lot of know-it-all, hypocritical, goody-two-shoes who think they're better than everybody else. They're judgmental, bigot, racist, homophobic. I've heard all these things and been called these things. And because most people have such a horrible image, I just keep my mouth shut as much as possible and ask questions. And then when they ask me what I believe, if they do, they're not happy to say it. But I tell them, but, but then I make a claim. I am a Christian. And they, if they go, why is that? I'm happy to talk about it. But I've showed I'm listening to them first. Yes, sir. Uh, two different, there's too many different religions to believe in. How do you know which one to believe in? Good question. So a lot of different religions, how do you know which one to believe in? That's a very good question. Each person answers that, not each person, but in general, most people answer that question differently. In my experience, most people answer that question, how do you know which religion to choose? based on usually one of two things, usually. I know this is simplistic, but in my experience for 30-something years in doing this stuff, that is, they find it intellectually satisfying or emotionally satisfying. It just feels right, makes them happy. Like living in Santa makes you happy when you're a kid. Makes me happy to think I'm being reincarnated. It makes me happy to think karma is going to get that guy punk who cut me off in traffic. It makes me happy to think about it. Others think it's intellectually. My own view is, I used to have a professor say this all the time because the professor told him, and his English teacher told him, uh, I wouldn't be a Christian if it just made sense but didn't feel right. I wouldn't be a Christian if it just felt right but didn't make sense. They have to go together. That's exactly my view. So the answer to your question is, how would one do it? You get to decide that, because I'm convinced that the God who created you gave you free will, and you get to decide for yourself. My encouragement to you is to consider which, or anybody, consider which religions make the most sense and feel the most right. And when you have, David, what do you mean make the most sense? I'm going to have a whole next six-week study, which I hope you'll come to, and I'll tell you exactly what I mean by make sense. But in essence, it, 
religions, if they're going to be true, they should make sense of what I experience in reality. That's one biggie. One biggie. Does it make sense of my reality? Like in Buddhism, all life is illusion. I think that's silly. Uh, all life is suffering. Dukkha. I think that's silly too. All life doesn't involve suffering. So, I mean, that doesn't ex I don't experience that. The Christian religion makes the most sense of my experience in reality. The second thing is, I think by far, it has the most historical evidence. For me also, that's why it rules out so many other religions. I don't believe in Thor and Zeus and all. We'll talk about this later. Because Christianity has historical reasons to believe it. And I personally, David, I need that. And I'm going to talk about here in just a little bit. Some people don't need all that evidence. They just have a religious experience and a dream and wake up and say, hey, that's enough for me. So I don't go and tell them, that's not good enough. <laughs> you don't get a PhD. No, no, no. Um, but I want it to be true, have evidence, and, and feel right. That's what I think. And, but most people do one of those two, the most other. Thank you. So John's saying he trusts the Holy Spirit's going to move him and tell him what to do. And I, uh, maybe afterwards we can talk more about that. But the belief in the Holy Spirit is a, what's called a contingent belief. That is, the Holy Spirit is only a view within the Christian worldview. If I'm an atheist and I hear that story, I'd go, why do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Why well, believe any of that? You don't have to answer right now. I'm saying that's, at this point, I'm talking about those first order questions, if that makes sense. I concur with you within Christianity. I think it's compelling to say the Holy Spirit can help us. But I still don't think it's different from what I just said. I think the Holy Spirit helps me understand the emotional side and the cognitive. Um, but to an atheist, Holy Spirit, well, to anybody, that's a particular term in a particular religion. Of all the world's religions, if, if someone asked the same question and said, why different religions? If someone said, because Allah spoke to me in a dream, and Muhammad spoke to me as well, that's why. Or Mormon's going to say, because I read the Book of Mormon, my heart got, my heart got warm. And that's what they exactly they say. I read it three times, and I felt a warm, fuzzy feeling in my heart, and that was enough for me. And then you say, I think the Holy Spirit tells us, see, already we have very different understandings of why we come to believe something. I believe. Right, so... If, if I can stop you there for a second, I hear what you're saying. So since Holy Spirit's true, you think everything else is man's invention. The Holy Spirit might be calling to an atheist, but he doesn't know. Right, Holy Spirit can work even though an atheist. That, that's right. Personally, when we talk to people who are not Christian, telling them about the Holy Spirit and say, here's why this is happening, usually is not very convincing to them. No, it doesn't mean it's false. It just means it's not convincing to them. And that's my point at this point. So, so atheism, um, is that broad picture... Most argument, atheists, real atheists, will make arguments against God's existence. And here's some big, it's usually the same ones. You can, I've listened to many debates, and the main ones are God's non-existence is analogous to the non-existence of Santa Claus. That is, God exists is just as realistic as Santa being existing, or Zeus or Thor. Now, I could talk about all these. Oh, that's so silly, but that's a big one. Two, the existence of widespread human and non-human suffering is incompatible with an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good being. Evil and suffering is the number one argument against God. I think it's I think it's one of the worst arguments conceivable, but it is one of the worst. It's, it's the most common one they use. I think it's a horrible argument against God's existence. Uh, I'm just giving my opinion right now. Three, uh, they'll say the nature of the universe and evolution shows that God didn't. We don't need God. Um, they'll say. A lack of enough evidence is a big one, and then they'll have some other ones, but those are the biggies. Let me say this last thing about atheism. We're going to move on. Atheism is not a religion. It is not a belief system. Many Christians say that. I wish they would stop. I think it's a way to say, uh-huh, we all have a religion. Yours is just atheism. That's silly nonsense. Atheism is not a religion. If you take the stock of a cycle... If you take the psychological state, atheism is at minimum a belief that God doesn't exist. That's not a religion. If you take what it's supposed to be, which is a proposition, that's still not a religion. It's not a religion. It's, it's just not. It's not a whole belief system. It's not a worldview. Atheism doesn't make you go kill people. It doesn't make you worship something. Atheism, it doesn't. If any of you think for sure or almost sure that unicorns don't exist, that's not a religion, right? Do you have a religion toward non-unicornism? That doesn't make any sense. 
but I wish Christians would knock that off because it's, that's not true. They have, most atheists have a worldview that is somewhat religious, but it is not atheism. It's called naturalism, and I want to talk a lot about that, hopefully tonight, if we get to it, we'll hope. So that's atheism, basically. Agnosticism was famously coined by a biologist, T.H. Th. Huxley, in the 19th century, um, and there's a long story there. I was in 1884, but basically it meant something along the lines of, I'm ignorant. <laughs> That's really all it means. Ah, Gnosticism means no knowledge. Nowadays, and I, I was going to give, I don't have time. I was going to give you the history of the term. I don't have time. But nowadays, the term agnostic is often used when the issue is God's existence to refer to those who follow the recommendation expressed by Huxley himself. Agnostic is a person who has entertained the proposition that there is God, but believes neither that it is true or nor that it's false. They've kind of thought about it. But again, this is a psychological state. I'm just not convinced. Some people call them strong agnostics, which is no one can ever know if God exists. That'd be like a strong form. A weak form is I just don't know. <laughs> and I've heard people do both. I've heard people say, and no one could ever know. Uh, do you believe in God? No. They'll say, I don't know, I'm not sure, and you, don't know, you couldn't know either. That's a strong form of agnosticism. No one can know. A weak form is, I just don't know. I'm, you know. I'll add this little footnote, because you'll hear this one too a lot. Um, and the agnostic category is a group of people. <laughs> they won't really say this exact title, but they're the open-minded ones. They're the open-minded. It's so true. We're the open-minded. I saw this great debate between atheists, really top names and top theists on one side, and then at the very end, when the debate, 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 they brought in this one extra speaker who's a scientist named Michio Kaku, Japanese-American scientist. He's on CNN and TV all the time. Smart guy. And he said, on one hand, you got the theists, and they're just certain God exists, which is completely false. No one on the stage thinks that. Well, at least I know one of the speakers, Bill Craig, the other one's never said they're certain. And then you got the atheists, and they're just certain God doesn't exist. And they also didn't speak that way. Because I think they're both wrong. And people went, yay! I mean, I'm open. He could. Maybe not. Maybe. But you see what happens? This is this intellectual, I'm above all you petty-minded certain people. I'm open to any option. And I've met people and read people and seen stuff online a lot they're the ones who think they're superior than everybody else. They just float above. They don't come and make up their mind because they're, they're really smart people. Just they're open forever. But that's a, that's a form of agnosticism. That's a form of agnosticism. That's, I don't know. I'll just keep taking my options. Quite frankly, I think it's an emotional thing to say, I don't want to pull, up, I don't want to pull the trigger. Because either way, what if I'm wrong and whatever. But. Okay, now we're going to talk about actual worldviews. The concept of, have you, are you familiar with the term worldview? I'm not trying to insult you. Would you raise your hand for me if you're familiar with the term worldview? Worldview, some of you. Worldview is hard to describe. Worldview, I see some of y'all have glasses on. I used to wear glasses for years and years and years and years and years. It's the lens. You have to look through the lens to see the world, right? Lens to see the world. A worldview was like that. It's called, one good definition I adapted and the fundamental cognitive orientation of an individual toward reality. Fundamental cognitive orientation of an individual toward reality. It's the way you just see the world. It's the way you think the world operates. What's reality really like? So, for example, you say, well, I believe in angels and demons. That's part of your worldview. You might say, no, that never exists. That's part of your worldview. Do you believe in ghosts or not? Do you believe in God or not? Do you believe that Humans are special or there's advanced primates, and they're special just because they're advanced primates. That's part of your worldview. It's how you see the world. It's a big picture idea. It's hard to define because it's like looking through the lens of glasses. That is, it's the way you see the world. Sometimes you never really, when you, I, again, I wore glasses forever. You forget glasses are on except when your nose start, my, and your nose can hurt and gets real oily and all that nonsense. Until something's wrong, sometimes you can forget they're on. Or if it gets dirty, then you take them off and look at your spectacles. Sometimes it's harder to look at. That's what I'm asking you to do right now. If you take off the way you think about the world and go, huh, how do I see reality? That's a worldview issue. 
theism is a worldview. Theism from theos just means godism. <laughs> the proposition, the truth claim, that an all-powerful creator God exists. All-powerful creator God exists. Notice how this omits, this cuts out almost every other religion that has ever existed. Hindus are not theists. Buddhists are certainly not theists. They're atheistic. That's billions of people gone. If theism is true, that means their religious beliefs are false. Their proposition that Brahman exists and karma, that proposition is false if theism is true. If theism is true, that means we're knocked down to one of, one of three religions. Judaism, Christianity, Islam. They're the only three you might say Zoroastrianism, but the big three, the only theistic religions, yeah. Are there, is there theism without monotheism? Because those ones are the monotheistic religions. Cor uh, not really. Okay. Can you have a theism without a monotheism? And the literature I've read, the answer is no, come to think of it. I haven't really thought about that, but the, you, most of the time they wouldn't put, like Hinduism is not theistic, they would call that. That's a kind of form of theism that's polytheism. But most people think of the word theism and they mean an all-powerful creator God. And of course, like in Hinduism, the creator God is one of the many gods and its name is Brahman, Brahma. Uh, but it's not, all, it's not overarching kind of God. Because if theism is true, it means, here's my circle, let's call this the universe. That means that God is not a part of the creation itself. If theism is true, let's assume for a second it is, it means that God is not a part of the universe. If I painted the picture on the back of this wall right here, the paintings I happened a few years ago, the painter who did this is not composed of paint. She might have gotten paint on her shirt, but she's not made to paint herself. When a chef bakes a cake, the chef is not made of flour and eggs. You might get the flour and eggs on her or him. You see the difference. Theism has a hard distinction between creation or universe versus creator. There's a big distinction. Let that sink in. Because that means there's no trace of God in creation. And I'm going to come back to that in just a second. So if someone says, are you, a, are you a theist? I would say, yes, I'm a theist. The answer is yes, I think there is a God. And the key here is, I think that God can reveal him or her itself before I talk about my Christianity to people. And that you see my arrow in the circle here? God can reveal himself, I'll say him for ease, to the universe. Deism, look on the screen here, deism on your handout, deism is basically the same thing, except a deist does not believe God interacts with the universe. That's basically the difference. When most atheists challenge you on Christianity, most of them will say, then where is he? So the challenge is, give me a blood sample or a DNA or blueprint, I mean, a, oh yeah, blueprint, a finger sample or something of God. As a theist, by definition, I cannot produce that. So I say that at the very beginning. If I'm talking to a rigorous, mean atheist, Right off the top, give me proof, evidence right now. And I'll talk a lot about evidence in a second. Um, they usually mean scientific evidence, like some kind of blood sample or photograph of God. That I would say, I do not have, I will never have, because I do not believe in that kind of God. Another thing you hear, atheist, oh, you athe your theists are all the same. We're just like you, in fact, as an atheist. You don't believe in all those millions of gods. We just got one more. There's only one God left between me and you. We're basically the exact same people. Do you believe in Thor? No. Zeus? No. See, me neither. But you believe in Yahweh? Yeah, I do. 
Well, just that, that we're the same besides one God. Let me say two quick things about that. Um, that's just like saying, oh, David, are you married? Yes. Well, I'm single. We're the exact same. The only difference is you're married. You've given your entire life to some one person forever and only be faithful to them. You see, yeah, that's a big difference. It's a big difference. I live with this person. I have children with this person. I've committed my life. One person away doesn't mean we're basically the same. Of course, in social status, I get it. My point is there are very different commitments being single versus being married. The second thing I'd say is when someone lumps in the same category of Yahweh with Thor and Zeus and the sun god Ra, the Egyptians, they do all of them. They'll bring up the most random. I've seen atheist debates. They'll list hundreds and hundreds of random god names on the projector. And they put Yahweh in there. That's a category area. It demonstrates, pardon me, but profound ignorance. Yahweh, Allah, cannot ever fit in the same category. Why is that, David? I'm saying this over and over and over. Because every other god, Zeus, Brahman, Thor, they're in the universe. Their god's here. Zeus lived on Mount Olympus. But they're figments of imagination. They're figments, figments of imagination, really. I think they're fig figments of imagination for two reasons. One is because we've now been to Mount Olympus. Gods don't live there. They're not the cause of the weather. Thunder doesn't happen or light doesn't happen because Thor sent it or Zeus sent it. We, can, we have scientific data that disproves they live there, like Santa doesn't live in the North Pole. That's why I don't believe in them. The second reason I don't believe in them is because Christianity is true, which means they have to be false. But the first I'll start with observational evidence. Do you see what I'm saying here? Yahweh, by definition, will never, ever be tested in here. The closest we get to finding our God in the universe is Jesus. Is Jesus. That means we've shoved now from this abstract, uh, um, not abstract, um, supernatural otherworldly to something that happens in history in the universe now the second that happens all bets are off you get the same historical scrutiny on that as you do shakespeare julius caesar any character did jesus really exist or not is the, the evidence demonstrated and it should get that scrutiny christianity should be scrutinized like because we're making historical claims thor is not historical claims zeus and even if it is we could look at the mountains where they live they're not there anymore so that gets rid of millions of gods very quickly. Yes, and then we'll move on. Okay, so the best we can do as theists is not, or, or uh, let me do it this way. If I'm a theist uh, and I look at this building, the person who designed this building, the architect who designed this halfway house basically between that building and that building, these are originally separate you were sitting on top of grass if you'd been here a few years ago, right? There's all been a grass, little meadow. And, but now there's a building here. Let's imagine the building themselves. The architect who designed this, I'll call him a he, is not here. I, this, you know, the architect's nose isn't right here and a blood sample on the carpet. And it's not, and no point in this building is, is made of the architect. If I really want to know the architect, I might look at hints at the way the architect, if there is one, designed this room. Like it's orderly and structured, it's weight-bearing. It seems like the person knows what they're talking about and they seems to know what they're doing. And I might design the interior designer is not in this room, but whoever painted and picked the colors, it's like that. So it'd be circumstantial evidence pointing to something else. Or if I read a story. When Shakespeare wrote his sonnets and wrote his, his, all of his drama, Shakespeare's not in the story. The closest analogy, and C.S. Lewis says it, is Dante, who wrote himself into the story of Inferno. So I hope you'll watch this short video by C.S. Lewis. Uh, it makes the exact point I'm making right now. So I hope you'll stay with me. Lewis. This is really worth it. The Russians, I am told, report that they have not found God in outer space. On the other hand, a good many people in many different times and countries claim to have found God or been found by God here on Earth. The conclusion some want us to draw from these data is that God does not exist. As a corollary, those who think they have met him on earth were suffering from a delusion. But other conclusions might be drawn. One, we have not yet gone far enough in space. There have been ships on the Atlantic for a good time before America was discovered. Two, God does exist, 
but is locally confined to this planet. A three, the Russians did find God in space without knowing it, because they lacked the requisite apparatus for detecting him. Four, God does exist, but is not an object either located in a particular part of space, nor diffused, as we once thought ether was, throughout space. The first two conclusions do not interest me. The sort of religion for which they could be a defense would be a religion for savages. The belief in a local deity who can be contained in a particular temple, island, or grove. That, in fact, seems to be the sort of religion about which the Russians, or some Russians, and a good many people in the West, are being irreligious. It is not in the least disquieting that no astronauts have discovered a god of that sort. The really disquieting thing would be if they had. The third and fourth conclusions are the ones for my money. Looking for God or heaven by exploring space is like reading or seeing all Shakespeare's plays in the hope that you will find Shakespeare as one of the characters, or Stratford as one of the places. Shakespeare is in one sense present at every moment in every play, but he is never present in the same way as Falstaff or Lady Macbeth nor is he diffused through the play like a gas. If there were an idiot who thought plays existed on their own without an author, our belief in Shakespeare would not be much affected by his saying, quite truly, that he had studied all the plays and never found Shakespeare in them. The rest of us, in varying degrees, according to our perceptiveness, found Shakespeare in the plays. But it is a quite different sort of finding from anything our poor friend has in mind. Even he has, in reality, been in some way affected by Shakespeare, but without knowing it. He lacked the necessary apparatus for detecting Shakespeare. And now, of course, this is only an analogy. I am not suggesting at all that the existence of God is as easily established as the existence of Shakespeare. And my point is that, if God does exist, he is related to the universe more as an author is related to a play, than as one object in the universe is related to another. If God created the universe, he created space-time, which is to the universe as the meter is to a poem, or the key is to music. To look for him as one item within the framework which he himself invented is nonsensical. If God, such a God as any adult religion believes in, exists, mere movement in space will never bring you any nearer to him or any farther from him than you are at this very moment. You can neither reach him nor avoid him by traveling to Alpha Centauri or even to other galaxies. A fish is no more and no less in the sea after it has swum a thousand miles than it was when it set out. How then, it may be asked, can we either reach or avoid him? The avoiding, in many times and places, has proved so difficult that a very large part of the human race failed to achieve it. But in our own time and place, it is extremely easy. Avoid silence, avoid solitude, avoid any train of thought that leads off the beaten track. Concentrate on money, sex, status, health, and, above all, on your own grievances. Keep the radio on, live in a crowd, use plenty of sedation. If you must read books, select them very carefully. But you'll be safer to stick to the papers. About the reaching, I am a far less reliable guide. That is because I never had the experience of looking for God. It was the other way around. Amen. He was the hunter, or so it seemed to me, and I was the deer. He stalked me like a redskin, took unerring aim, and fired. And I am very thankful that that is how the first conscious meeting occurred. It forearms one against subsequent fears that the whole thing was only wish fulfillment. Something one didn't wish for can hardly be that. But it is significant that this long evaded encounter happened at a time when I was making a serious effort to obey my conscience. No doubt it was far less serious than I supposed, but it was the most serious I had made for a long time. One of the first results of such an effort is to bring your picture of yourself down to something near a lifestyle. And presently, you begin to wonder whether you are yet, in any full sense, a person at all. Whether you are entitled to call yourself I. It is a sacred name. In that way, the process is like being psychoanalyzed, only cheaper. I mean in dollars. In some other ways, it may be more costly. You find that what you called yourself is only a thin film on the surface of an unsounded and dangerous sea. 
but not merely dangerous. Radiant things, delights and inspirations come to the surface, as well as snarling resentments and nagging lusts. One's ordinary self is, then, a mere facade. There's a huge area out of sight behind it. And then, if one listens to the physicists, one discovers that the same is true of all things around us. These tables and chairs, this magazine, the trees, clouds and mountains are facades. Poke scientifically into them and you find the unimaginable structure of the atom. That is, in the long run, you find mathematical formulas. There are you, whatever you means, sitting reading. Out there, whatever there means, is a black page with white marks on it. And both are facades. Behind both lies, well, whatever it is. The psychologists and the theologians, though they use different symbols, equally use symbols when they try to probe the depth behind the facade called you. That is, they can't really say, it is this. But they can say, it is in some way like this. And the physicists trying to probe behind the other facade can give you only mathematics. And the mathematics may be true about the reality, but it can hardly be the reality itself, any more than contour lines are real mountains. I am not in the least blaming either set of experts for this state of affairs. They make progress. They are always discovering things. The point, however, is that every fresh discovery, far from dissipating, deepens the mystery. And presently, if you are a person of a certain sort, if you are one who has to believe that all things which exist must have unity, it will seem to you irresistibly probable that what lies ultimately behind the one facade also lies ultimately behind the other. And then, again, if you are that sort of person, you may come to be convinced that your contact with that mystery in the area you call yourself is a good deal closer than your contact through what you call matter. For in the one case, I, the ordinary, conscious I am continuous with the unknown depth. And after that, you may come, some do, to believe that that voice, like all the rest I must speak symbolically, that voice which speaks in your conscience and in some of your intensest joys, which is sometimes so obstinately silent, sometimes so easily silenced, and then at other times so loud and emphatic, is in fact the closest contact you have with the mystery, and therefore finally to be trusted obeyed, feared, and desired more than all other things. But still, if you are a different sort of person, you will not come to this conclusion. I hope everyone sees how this is related to the astronautical question from which we started. The process I have been sketching may equally well occur, or fail to occur, wherever you happen to be. Space travel really has nothing to do with the matter. To some, God is discoverable everywhere. To others, nowhere. Those who do not find him on Earth are unlikely to find him in space. But send a saint up in a spaceship and he'll find God in space as he found God on Earth. Much depends on the seeing eye. And this is especially confirmed by my own religion, which is Christianity. When I said a while ago that it was nonsensical to look for God as one item within his own work, the universe, some readers may have wanted to protest. They wanted to say, but surely, according to Christianity, that is just what did once happen. Surely, the central doctrine is that God became man and walked about among other men in Palestine. If that is not appearing as an item in his own work, what is it? The objection is much to the point. To meet it, I must readjust my old analogy of the play. One might imagine a play in which the dramatist introduced himself as a character into his own play and was pelted off the stage as an impudent imposter by the other characters. It might be rather a good play. If I had any talent for the theatre, I'd try my hand at writing it. But since, as far as I know, such a play doesn't exist, we had better change to a narrative work, a story into which the author puts himself as one of the characters. We have a real instance of this in Dante's Divine Comedy. Dante is one the muse outside the poem who is inventing the whole thing, and two, a character inside the poem whom the other characters meet and with whom they hold conversations. Where the analogy breaks down is that everything the poem contains is merely imaginary, in that the characters have no free will. They, the characters, can say to Dante only what Dante, the poet, 
has decided to put into their mouths. I do not think we humans are related to God in that way. I think God can make things which not only, like a poet's or novelist's characters, seem to have a partially independent life, but really have it. But the analogy furnishes a crude model of the Incarnation in two respects. One, Dante the poet and Dante the character are in a sense one, but in another sense two. This is a faint and far-off suggestion of what theologians mean by the union of the two natures, divine and human, in Christ. Two, the other people in the poem meet and see and hear Dante, but they have not even the faintest suspicion that he is making the whole world in which they exist and has a life of his own outside it, independent of it. It is the second point which is most relevant. For the Christian story is that Christ was perceived to be God by very few people indeed, perhaps for a time only by St. Peter, who would also, and for the same reason, have found God in space. For Christ said to Peter, Flesh and blood have not taught you this. The methods of science do not discover facts of that order. Make sense? Those of you follow it? So when, people talk, so when people talk about theism, you pick a particular one that you're a theist. I'm a Christian theist. I'm a theist, but I'm a Christian theist. If you say, David, you don't believe in those other gods. That's right, I don't. No more than I believe in any god that's ever been, I would think, invented. I believe in a god that is outside of the whole space-time continuum. That makes me a theist. And I think that god can and has revealed himself. That's why I'm a theist and not a deist. And that's a big difference. And so I'm not looking for God as another being in the universe because that's not the kind of God I believe in. The closest I get is Jesus, and that's an historical claim, and then I'll go to that later on. And one quick word about religion, because this is really important. A religion is usually some kind of set of beliefs, calls nature and purpose of the universe, usually by some superhuman means, there's ritual observances, usually a sacred text, and so forth. That's all good. For centuries, religion, any religion, was considered a form of knowledge. Everybody thought that when you had a religious claim, you're talking about, you're trying to talk about the way things really are. Knowledge claims. Knowledge claims. Facts based on actual reality. Thus, religions were always considered true or false. Does that make sense to you? Either you're reincarnated or you're not. It either happens or it doesn't. Now, today, religion isn't considered knowledge by most people. Instead, religions have moved to a radically different category now they represent our personal psychological preferences. They're no longer knowledge. They're just personal preferences. This is a big, all these are a big deal. This is a really big deal when you dialogue with people who are not Christians. It is always safe to assume when you're talking to a non-Christian that they do not think Christianity is a knowledge claim about the way the world is. They think it's a way of talking about what you just happen to personally preference. There's no difference in a religion versus your particular take on a favorite restaurant. No difference. Let's say my favorite Tex-Mex place is on the border. And I go, that's my favorite. And I said, on the border is the best. It is, and somebody goes, yeah, well, I don't like it. No, no, no. I say, no, no, it's, it's the best. And Damon says, well, I like it, but I, it's not that. No, no, Damon, it is the best restaurant there is. He might go, whatever, man. He might think I'm being silly. And I go, no, no, Damon, you understand. It is literally the best. It's a true proposition. There is no other greater restaurant for Mexican food than on the border. Damon might be a little frustrated, especially when Damon goes, wait a second, David. You're talking as if your preference were on the border, your taste buds or you make it sound like it's objective, like there really is a best restaurant. It doesn't work that way. You like, you don't. I don't maybe I don't like Mexican food. No, no, Damon. 
And on top of that, let's imagine that I form a whole group of people of on the boardians. And we get together once a week. And we make up songs to on the border. And we talk about how important it is. And we go out and tell other people that they're wrong for thinking other restaurants are not as good as on the border. How stupid would you think they are? On top of that, think on the boardians cause all the wars. They're the reason why people are racist. They're the reason why they're anti-science. On the boardians do all the bad things in the world. That's what atheists, most of them think about you if you're a Christian. There's no difference. So when you start saying Christianity is true, that's just like saying on the border is the best restaurant. It doesn't make any sense to most of them. And that's because it's moved to a different category error. It's called, it's called a, it, they would call it a category error. That is, you messed up, David. And again, that's why they get so mad when you start saying Jesus said, I am the way and the, truth. and no one goes to the Father but by, it makes them ticked off. That sounds so close-minded and bigoted. That's why they say, who are you to say that your personal preference should be someone else's? What's true for you is not true for and what they, and for me, and they mean that preference. If it's true for you, then on the board is best. It's not my favorite. And who are you to say this difference? That whole discussion is only possible if you think that religions are no longer based on knowledge but preference. I'm trying to save you an enormous amount of heartache and headache that I didn't realize for years when I talked to non-believers. This is absolutely true. So let me say this as clearly as I can. This is nonsense. Religion is not just a preference. Religious claims are propositional truths. They are either true or false. It is either true that Jesus was and is the Messiah, or he is not. There's no middle ground. If he is not, then Jews are correct. Christians are completely wrong, and it is a false religion. Joseph Smith either really is the final prophet who got the golden plates, or he did not, and it is false. We either really are reincarnated. All Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, they're all the same. They believe in a cycle of called samsara. You're born, you live, you build up karmic stuff all around, then you die and you get reborn. That's billions of people around the planet who believe everybody's stuck in this cycle of samsara, and the universe itself is going through cycles. Judaism, Christians, and Muslims say, no, time is linear. It began, and it's going to come to an ending. We cannot both be right. And logic is called the law of excluded middle. Someone's wrong. And if someone's wrong, on both sides, billions of people believe in something that's false. Billions. But David, they're so authentic. Mm -hmm. They're authentically wrong. But they're so passionate. They're passionately wrong. They can be passionately convinced they saw Elvis in Vegas. He's dead. And go to his grave and you zoom his body. Don't mind what you think. Your passion is irrelevant. And same thing is true with Christianity. I can be as passionate as I want about Jesus. But if you can, you can falsify my beliefs. You say you're deluded. And I'll talk about that in a second. There's a way to falsify my own beliefs. So my passion's irrelevant. Uh, how much my parents taught me is irrelevant. How old the religion seems to be is irrelevant. These are knowledge claims. They are true or false. And they can't all be true. I taught world religions at a college for several years in Texas, and I'm just saying at this point, if you haven't studied them, just, if you want, trust me, they do not say the same thing. They are fundamentally different understandings of how the world works. The worldviews are radically different. And everybody who ever tells you opposite has never studied religions. They have never. I've heard that for years. They go, they all say the same thing. I go, really, like what? You know, like, be a good person. <laughs> Can you tell me any basics about Buddhism or Hinduism? What did Siddhartha Gautama teach? What did, what did Jews teach? What, they don't know anything. They think it's all about morality. I talked to a guy the other day who's an atheist. had lunch with him. And he said um, he's convinced all religions are good. They're not true because he's an atheist. Um, he was forced Mormonism for years, and now he's very anti-religion. Uh, then he calmed down. I'm not as anti now. I'm open to it. But they're good in that. They're all good that they help people get past their potential and strive in life. So they're all, they're all basically the same. They all help people get over their difficulties and help be their best selves. 
Now, I didn't follow up. We talked about morality. I came out, but because I didn't want to say no, because uh, right now I'm asking questions. Tell me more. Why do you think that? Why do you think that? Why do you think that? Now, everything you said is completely silly to me, but it wasn't my time to say it. But see, the reason why he can say that is because it's not knowledge. He gets to pick and choose. The other day I was talking to a person who, uh, it was a couple, that they were, right before they died, they decided to pick and choose. They said, well, what did you believe about afterlife? They said, well, right before, I think it was their parents, or they died. They just, they just chose different parts of all the religions, all the parts they liked. And they, and they said they deliberately made up their own religion. I mean, can you do that? Sure, but that's just, no religion says that. No one religion, all religions think they've got the claim of reality. They've got it just right. They know what the problem is, and their religion is the solution, and we're all arguing for truth, but we can't all be right. Now, I need to, um, let me pause there quickly. Is there anything else you need to say about that? Any questions or comments about that? I, I thought my religion was right. You thought your religion was right? Yeah, I thought mine was the right one. Of course you think that. I think mine's right, too. But again, as they say, in the marketplace of ideas, we all think that. Everybody thinks that. Every religion. If you're a religion, if you're an atheist, you go, you think your non-belief is right. Who deliberately holds a false belief? Everyone thinks what they believe is true. So it's, it's when they, well, you Christians are closed-minded. You think you're right. Yeah, I do. Do you think you're right? Well, do you, what do you believe? Well, that there's no God. You think you're right or you think you're wrong? No, we all think we're right. So let's get past that silly nonsense and go, we both think we're right. Sure. So why do we think we're right? We can't both be right, but let's talk about it. Let's, what do you think? And so I'm open to listening to the evidence. I'm listening to data. But this whole thing like we're the really open-minded, but you think you're closed-minded and right. Another thing I've heard, I at this church. People who used to come here closed me, called me that, called me names like that, a lot of names. Uh, like, I mean, closed-minded. Because if I had an idea about something, you're closed-minded. And I go, say more for me. What does that mean to be closed-minded? What they really meant was I had come to a conclusion. I go, huh, well, so when I make up my mind about something that's being closed-minded, well, yeah, okay, I think that's absurd. I, I think people, I've made up my mind that I'm married. Am I closed-minded about that? That's, that defies every definition I've heard of. But that's what happens when you talk in this kind of slippery language of nonsense, that, that we, we make up our minds. The person who was trying to, who was con condescending me and slamming me had also closed his mind down against a whole host of things. But I didn't call it that because it's not. It's just you made up your mind. I don't find your reasons convincing. Great. But I don't call you closed-minded about it. Closed-minded is when you say you make up your mind and I'm not listening to any other evidence. Mm -mm. I'm not even talking about it. But I would say that leans toward closed-minded. And that I am not. I've spent my entire life. Okay, well, I'll move on quickly. Number six. This is where we get um, to another worldview. This is the worldview. This is a huge topic, enormous amount of literature. I'm going to give it as simple as I can. Metaphysical naturalism or materialism, I'm going to use those basically the same. So when you hear me say the term naturalist or materialist, I'm using it to be basically the same thing. Most atheists are naturalist. Most, athe most, most atheists are materialist, same thing. And the basically, here's the things that go together. Nature encompasses all that exists throughout space and time. So you might say the universe. That's nature. Everything in the universe, everything you can think of, every atom, every star, everything, that's nature. Two, the universe is only made of physical stuff, mass and energy. Now, if you know your Einstein's equation, E equals MC squared, energy and mass are interchangeable. So I will often say energy and mass, a matter, they go back and forth. If you've never heard that before, it's true, but that's what happens. Um, Energy can turn into mass, mass can turn into energy, it's just that's how it works back and forth. Uh, but they believe nature, the universe, everything, and that means you and me, e including the naturalist, you are nothing more than a conglomeration of physical stuff. That's it. That's it. That's what they say, you're just made of stars. Now, they have two different kinds of naturalists. They call them a reductive materialist or non-reductive materialist. The reductive materialist says everything, including, the phys including what you think are thoughts, mental events in your brain, those are just physical events. They're nothing but biochemical changes in your gray matter. And that's everything about you is physical and can be described by physical laws. The non-reductive materialist says 
Well, no, a mental event is not the same. It's something different. But everything else is matter and energy. Uh, my own opinion is there's no such thing as a non-reductive materialist. To me, that's like a coward. Go all in. If you're a materialist, be a materialist. A non-reductive says everything is physical except your brain states. That's a little different. Consciousness is different. But you'll meet people who are atheists, who are naturalistic, who think mental states, meant my thoughts about this, whatever, this stand here, those aren't physical. But most people go all in. I've heard, I've watched panels. It's the new cutting edge thing, brother. The new cutting edge thing, one of the cutting edge things in neuroscience is to determine how the brains are controlled by physical laws, like the laws of gravity, the laws of quantum mechanics. Because I think everything that happens in your brain is physical. I'll talk more about that later. But that's materialism. Nature operates by laws of physics, which means in principle, every single thing that has ever happened ever and ever will happen ever can be explained by the scientific method. Everything, eventually. Of course, that means the supernatural doesn't exist, period. There is no such thing as supernatural because all that exists is the natural. A, natural. That's it. That's why it's a naturalist or metaphysic or materialism. Carl Sagan, there was a show that came back on, I think it was the 70s and 80s. He started out with one line called The Cosmos. I think his name of the show, The Cosmos. And Carl Sagan would say, the cosmos is all that there is or ever was or ever will be. He was a materialist. He was a naturalist. The cosmos is all there is, all there ever was, all there ever will be. That is a classic, succinct mantra of the materialist. Most atheists are materialist or metaphysical naturalist. Most. This is a worldview. Atheism is not, atheism is not a worldview. This is the worldview. It's just that usually they go together. Most atheists I've ever read and heard and met are naturalist by worldview. The only problem with this, there's a lot of them, um, one is it's self-contradictory. This statement, the only things which exist are made of matter and energy, means the truth proposition in that statement doesn't exist. <laughs> that is, I know this is philosophical, the proposition, that is the content of the sentence, the only thing that exists is matter and energy, isn't made of matter and energy, which means it doesn't exist, which means it's not real. That's self-contradictory. That's a large argument, and I'll talk a lot more later on, is like you said, is their thoughts don't mean anything. That's a very common critique, and I'll have to say a lot more about that. I concur with you. What philosophers usually say is, it would mean, it means well, several things. One is, there is no you. You don't have thoughts. The brain in that body is speaking to the brain in this body. And secondly, and I'll talk a lot more later, just real fast, it also means you don't, you can't, the brain in your body can't help but say, what the brain is saying because of evolutionary processes and the laws of physics. There is no you, and they will say this explicitly, free will is an absolute illusion. You, you are an absolute determinist. Why? Because physics controls everything. That's letter C. Nature operates with laws of physics. So they can convince themselves that anything that happens was meant to be anyway. So. Anything that happens was meant to be. Yeah, they would say there, there is no... Zero design, zero intentionality, zero free will, um, zero. I mean, it is zero. I think it's absolutely absurd. Everyone assumes that when they are speaking, they are wanting to say what they're saying. And they assume, if you have a different view, that you are wrong and that they are right, which assumes there's truth. They assume that I am here to convince you that you're wrong. All that is stupid if you're just evolved primates and you're controlled by physics. I, I haven't said this yet because it would sound too snotty, but I would if, if they pushed me. I would say, why are you trying to convince me when my brain's forced me to believe this? Who are you to try to tell my evolutionary impulses that my Christianity is false? That's nonsense. You think you're right. You think you've somehow surpassed. It's, it's absolutely self-contradictory. It doesn't matter. This is the dominant view of atheism. Whatever you say about anything, this whole rest of the study, they're going to say it doesn't really matter. There's no explanation. They're going to say it doesn't matter. We'll figure it out eventually. That's letter C. Eventually we're going to figure it out. So here's a naturalist. <laughs> You're in a fish tank. The naturalist says, one of the fish on the left, orange fish comes up because he has red hair. 
He comes up to the naturalist and says, hey, hey, buddy, you think this is all that exists? Is the fish tank? The naturalist says, of course, dummy. Hey, what do you think that, what do you think that food comes to the top of the water? Well, we don't know yet. I say, well, what if, what if there's something out there that gives us food? The naturalist says, that's a stupid question. We all know there's nothing outside the fishbowl. And I say, huh, where do you think the food comes from? I've already told you that. We don't know yet, but give it a chance. Scientists are going to figure that out. Don't be lazy. Don't be a feeder of the gaps. Just make up things just because you don't understand it. Give it time. Science will figure it out. I go, huh. Well, what do you think those big shadows are on the outside of the fishbowl? People get beaten on the bowl. Nothing. We don't know yet, but science is going to figure it out. No matter what it is you bring up, the natural says all that exists is the fishbowl. You need to know, right now among you, all over Lawrence and the world, you're surrounded by naturalists. This is a worldview, which means they think it's true, which means it's a good question to say, huh, why do you think that's true? See, naturalism is assumed. Because you can't argue that all that exists is science. You can't prove all that exists is, is matter and energy. You have to assume it. That's a presumption. But it's absolutely imperative to understand that this is a worldview. It is not science versus religion. That's a constant nonsense debate on YouTube or newspaper, Newsweek. Science has disproven God. Nonsense. It's worldview versus worldview. What is really debated is whether naturalism and Christianity, that's the issue, or naturalism and Judaism, naturalism, those are worldview, competing worldviews, that makes sense. Christianity is not a methodology of how to discover things. We're not competing against science. It's not a methodology. It's a worldview. So we'll get that real clear. So I'll talk, I'm out of time on that one. The last thing is this, logical positivism, scientism. This is a methodological assumption. Science, or the scientific method, is a methodology. There are people who believe that only one type of evidence which gives us truth, only one, and that which is discovered by the scientific method. Now, why is that? Typically because they're naturalists. If all that exists is matter and energy, then the scientific method, which studies matter and energy, is the only of a methodology which should be practiced to give us truth or knowledge. And if science can't answer the question, it means the question is meaningless. Think about that. If science can't answer it, they would say it is a meaningless question. In the 1920s, 20s, and 30s, they had a fancy name in philosophy. It called it logical positivism. The only problem is it's inherently self-contradictory. <laughs> the statement, the only truth which exists is demonstrated by science, can't be demonstrated scientifically. I'll say that one more time. The statement, the only truth which exists is demonstrated by science, can't be demonstrated scientifically. Scientism has no scientific basis for it. That's why it was abandoned. So for a, over a hundred years, philosophers have said this is nonsense. No philosopher holds to this of you anymore. There's a guy named A.J. Ayer and others. I mean, it was abandoned. They tried real hard in Oxford and some other places to make it work. As a system, it was abandoned. It's nonsense. But guess what? Boy, is it popular amongst what's called the new atheist. Scientists, atheistic scientists, don't realize, don't know, they're not philosophers, this was abandoned 100 years ago, but it is the dominant way they think of, of the way the world works. Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, if you watch the news today, I'm telling you, if you talk to the average normal atheist, they will assume some form of scientism, that if you really want to know about anything that ever exists in the world of reality, science is going to prove it. In philosophy, that was abandoned 100 years ago, but now it makes it amongst, well, ignorant scientists. Peter Atkins is a chemist at Oxford. He wrote a textbook on chemistry. It's one of the standard books on chemistry. He, he absolutely believes in scientism. And he's talked about that against all the time. This is nonsense. If you want, you like listening to stuff, go on YouTube and watch a Veritas Forum by the MIT professor Ian Hutchinson. Ian Hutchinson. MIT professor Ian Hutchinson. He has a whole Veritas Forum on scientism about how silly, uh, how false it is. They really believed if science hadn't proved it, it was nonsense. So if Linda comes up to a person and he said, 
and you're talking to a person in the subway and they say, hey, do you think God exists? If they're being real rigorous and they have this view, they're going to say, does God exist? And you go, well, yeah. They go, that's, a, that's like saying, blah, 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 blah. You say, what are you talking about? You say, blah, blah, blah. Because science can't prove that question. That means the question is meaningless. Those the words you put in the sentence don't mean anything because science can't prove that yes or no. They really do think that. It's a stupid question. If I say, where do you think the universe came from? That's a stupid question. Science can't answer that question, so it's a meaningless question. It's meaningless. I've heard scientists, smart people say this, so it is a methodological view. And one quick thing on this, event versus agent causation, and we'll wrap up here. Uh, this last, almost done. Y'all, is it okay if y'all stick with me for a second? Because this all, some of you are making faces, I can't tell if you're asleep or mad, you're pondering this. Before I move on, does that make sense what I'm saying so far about scientism is? It's a methodological assumption that if anything in the world happens, exists. If, if Anna says, if Anna were talking to a scientism person, that logical part, what do you think love is? They're going to say, well, scientists tell us it's chemical reactions in the brain. If you said, well, is there more to it? They're going to say, no. No, the answer is no. If science can't demonstrate it, it doesn't exist. Why? That's a dumb question to even ask the question. Historically, everyone's known all the way back to Aristotle. There are two different kinds of causes, and this is going to be common sense to you. Event causation versus agent. Science event causation, let's start there. This is real short. Science tells us how does it work. How does it work? Why does it do that? Why does this mark when I drop it? Why does it fall down? That's what science would tell me. Which means it only seeks for whatever event or state of affairs that caused it to fall. That's all it looks for. Science is one big, fat, long cause and effect chain. <laughs> My marker fell. That's the effect. And I'm going to say, what, what caused that? That cause is, some, is actually an effect of something else. What caused that? What caused that? Forever. Think about that. If a billiard ball rolls on the pool table and it hits the ball and it hits the ball and I start at the very end, why did that ball move? Because that ball hit it. Why did that ball move? Because that ball hit it. All the way back. That's all science does, which is great. It gives us pacemakers and microwaves and fuzzy tacos. Event, it asks for those. It gives me events. It cannot, must not ask anything else. That's what science does. It's looking for events. So if I say anything about anything in the universe, back to my fish tank analogy. I'm talking to a person who believes in scientism. Where do you think that food comes from? Well, obviously it's something in the fish tank. I go, no, no, I mean, it just appears. I mean, wouldn't you agree it just appears? And we can analyze it. The chemistry of that fish food is different from the water and from me and you. Where do you th why does it pop into existence? They're going to say either, we don't know, it's a dumb question because science can't answer it, or they're going to say, well, we'll figure it out. We're, going to, we're just going to figure it out. It's got to be a cause within the fish tank. It has to be. And I go, it has to be? Is it conceivable it came outside of the fish tank? No, it's not conceivable. What do you mean it's not conceivable? Because all that exists is matter and energy. See, they're naturalists. All that exists is the fish tank. I go, what if there's more? What do you mean there's more? That's ridiculous. Science could never prove there's more. You go, right, but you're believing. <laughs> what if it's possible? They don't answer that question. The last thing, a kind of causation, is agent causation. Agent is this, a person with causal powers. Agent causation typically answers the question of origin or why. Why did it begin? Back to my billiard balls. I'm a pool table. I throw those balls, and I, that ball hit that ball, that ball. But I'm going to say, but why did it first move in the first place? Usually that's an agent causation. I like how the author of Hebrews 3 says, 3, 4 says, For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. That's agent causation. Physicians make this all the time. You ever heard on the news or you go to the hospital, she died of natural causes? If you go to a courtroom? Now, what does that mean? It means no agent calls the event. Might have been a heart attack. Died of natural causes causes. So no agent caused the event, but other material or physical events caused it. If she died of natural causes, it means no one's going to be blamed for murder. Died of natural causes. That's event causation. Natural causes. Agent causation is something very different. 
I can look at my truck and say, where did that truck come from? Was it natural causes or something else? Well, yeah, natural, because it came from a factory and these robots designed it, da, da, da. Well, at first, there's the illusion that it came just from a factory. But when I start analyzing it, I realize there's more to it. The factory had to have software code that was written by a person. Or if I said, where does that Model T come from? There's two, see these different explanations all the time? If I said, where did the Model T truck come from? It came from this Ford factory, about da 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 and I go, but if someone said, it came from Henry Ford, one's an event causation explanation, one's an agent. If someone said, hey, it looks like there's a hot tea on the stove. Why is, the, why is there tea on the stove? And you go, well, why is, it, why is there boiling tea? Well, what happens is we turn on the, this gas beneath it, heats up molecules in the air beneath it, it hits the, the, the metal and heat transference, goes to the metal, the molecules. It shakes a lot. When it gets vivid and hotter, it changes and it makes it boil and you start, and then the whistle is going to go off. Right? I'm giving the physics behind it. Or if Linda said, because I want a tea. <laughs> Those are both absolutely acceptable explanations. One is event physical laws, and one is agent. I wanted it. At some point, you have to ask the question, why did it start in the first place? Someone who believes in scientism completely, listen, disregards agent causation. Everything that occurs has natural causes. David, what about that murder analogy? Oh, you could trace back a murder completely through physical processes, all governed by the laws of nature. This, of course, is determinism, back we were talking about, Susan. But it wasn't a heart attack? No, no, no. She was stabbed 38 times. Stabbed? So who did it? They were like, who did it? What a dumb question. What a dumb question. Well, I thought Vanna did it. Well, no, I mean, but you, I don't, why would you, why even evoke an agent called Vanna? Because Vanna did it. She's got the knife. No, that, that's ridiculous. The reason why... The person died is because they died of lacerations because of cutting the blood vein. Okay, but why did they? Die? Why was it bleeding in the first place? Oh, because they were cut. Why were they cut? Because a knife went through their body. Why did a knife go through their body? Can I just say Vanna did it? No, that's ridiculous. The reason why a knife went body is because Vanna's body shoved through the laws of gravity and force of her muscles into the foot. But why did she do that? That's a silly question. Because at the time, biochemical reactions in her brain, caused by evolutionary impulses and the laws of physics, made her brain push that hand into... You see, I can go back as much as possible to physical laws and evolutionary needs. So we're all nuts. We're not all. They would say there's always an explanation based on everything's natural. Now, when that happens, of course, it means, it means there's no court system. There's no one's culpable of anything. No one should go to jail. No, the, the very, and I, I'll probably say this later on, the very first uh, court example of diminished responsibility was two boys this back in the 40s or so, after evolution had really become popular, they said they wanted to feel like what, see what it felt like to kill. So they went and got a boy and killed him. They murdered him. They said it. Did you do it? Yeah, we did it. Why'd you do it? Well, we wanted to see what it felt like to kill someone. The lawyer, they went to court, the defense attorney, of course, they're innocent to proven guilty. They admitted it right off the bat. Guess what the defense attorney said? They're innocent because, it's not their fault because, their choices were set in motion millions of years ago through evolutionary processes that led them to their brain to this place. It was the first courtroom, as far as I can tell, the first courtroom uh, decision of diminished responsibility. They got off the hook. No moral. It can't be responsible. It can't be. It's all event causation. There's no more agent. Yes, sir. Oh, so, right, so you give an example of, like in Hebrews 9, which says, all will face judgment, God is the agent, and the event is us dying. That's right. Well, so I, my view, and I, quite frankly, I think any rational person ever is convinced both of these are legitimate responses to the question of how come. I think you have to have both. And I think it's an example you have to have both. I think people who rule out agent causation, I think everything's natural all the time, I think that's absurd. I do. I think, I think it's unconvincing. I think both are there. I think if it says she died of natural causes or Vanna did it, I'm going to stop, but Vanna did it. Like Vanna, stop. Stop killing people, Vanna. So I think they both good. All I'm saying is if you're going to be real rigorous and consistent, these people will rule out agent causation. I've heard Richard Dawkins, who's a well-known atheist, he has said this many, 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 many times. If you bring up agent causation, he says, it's a stupid question, you're being petty, it's a dumb question. 
You're being lazy and small-minded. I've heard him say that many times. If you say, do you think maybe the food from the fish tank came from God? That's a petty question, stupid question. So that's the kind of stuff. I'm saying this is real. I'm not making this up. I'm being mean. It's a real deal. Um, but that's the deal. I actually want to keep going. But I'm going to stop there because we're over time now. And I, I didn't get as far as I really wanted. But next time we'll pick up at the very end of this. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Please. Absolutely astute observation. That is apps. So to say it one more time, because it's exactly right. The move, the ethical move of a naturalist to it's perfectly acceptable to kill babies is a logical extension of this worldview. Yes, ma'am. Most people I've met in my life who think it's perfectly fine to kill babies. There are philosophers, I can give you names of people I have in sermons. A guy teaches at Princeton who argued that it's, it's much better off to commit infanticide. That is, after the baby comes out, kill him her if the baby is unwanted or has some kind of defect that's the right thing to do and i have experienced with people like that they're naturalist yeah. i ask them why do you think that and it's because they do not believe that humans have what we usually call intrinsic worth that is there's something extra special just because they're human what naturalists do is they'll and i oh woo, i get worked up what naturalists will do is say humans are special and they define special by capacity. Oh, yes. Humans are special by capacity. Humans can reason more than chimpanzees. Humans can get taller than an ant. Oh, there's capacities. When you define significance and value by capacity, it is arbitrary, which means anybody gets to decide at what time the person is no longer human. You can. So if, and that's exactly what they do. If you're a naturalist, you say, well, of course we're special. We're not just evolved primates. We have, we're very special evolved primates. And I'll say, great. Well, if I define which capacity is, that's what they do. They say, well, for example, I'm not really special until I have advanced cognitive skills, which means I can kill off every, every human I want from conception until the age of three. They're no different from... A little sheep or some I don't want. Who cares? The glob of cells. If you start defining these capacities the way you want. In the Christian worldview, that's abhorrent. Christians believe that humans have a value that is given to them by a designer. But if I'm a naturalist, they're exactly right. If I were a naturalist, I'd make the same argument that they make. If I were a naturalist, I'd say, what possible difference does it make? If I want to get rid of every disabled, senior citizen, mentally retarded, anybody who didn't fit the Aryan race, blonde hair, blue eyes, what difference does it make? Because we are a glob of cells. If you're a naturalist, if you're not, and I'm not a naturalist, <laughs> but I'm saying at least they're being consistent. I'm sorry to jump in there, but it, their own loved ones, they will say, when it comes to morality, most will say, my own loved ones are different because through evolutionary impulses, we have come to have special affection toward those who propagate our species. And that's one thing they would say. That's usually the thing I've heard the most. But it's not because the humans are, you might say, intrinsically worthwhile by themselves. It's just because I have a biochemical reaction to them because of commonality, because of bloodline, DNA, chromosomes are similar. But there's nothing deeper to it. It's a biochemical thing. They've asked people, I've heard, I mean, I've read all the books. They read Richard Dawkins. Those, so there's nothing more to love than just biochemical. They'll say, I wish it were the case, but it's no. The answer is no. No. I mean, I could give you, I was going to, I, there's so many quotes. People say, I did this in a sermon a few months ago. A person says, um, it was Daniel, Daniel Dennett? No, it was uh, Michael Roos. Michael Roos, who's a real nice guy, but he's a naturalist. And he says, I know when someone says, love your neighbor as yourself, they think they're talking about something really good, but they're not at all. We're nothing but, someone calls us uh, moist meat, but moist machines. That is, we're just, we don't have a, Richard Dawkins says we are at bottom. There is no good, no evil, petty indifference. We are dancing to the tune set by our genes. We don't have a choice. And he write, it's called The Selfish Gene. He's written a lot of books, but that book is called The Selfish Gene where he says that. And he says, in the selfish gene, even though our genes drive everything we do and they're nothing but selfish and they want to kill everything that gets in our way, we should say no to that and be altruistic and be kind to people. Everyone has said in response, 
Why? And he says, because that's the right thing to do. <laughs> that's exactly what I'm telling you. It's exactly when they go, wait a second. But see, you have to say that because everything until that point, everything until the point, be nice to people, is exactly what eugenics people said. It's what Hitler said. I've read the snippets in Mein Kampf. When he says that, you get rid of its battle, struggle, battle, fit, whatever, but Dawkins, be nice to people. Who's their authority? They're going to say no. They're going to say, but they're going to say that. They're going to say, they've said this. That's a dumb question. We all know it's better to be nice and help our species survive. To which the question goes, why does that matter? Why does it matter our species? Back to capacity. Because we're special. Why well, makes us special? Because we have advanced levels of intelligence. So what? But it's meaningless. But it's mean, what they'll say, no, no. They're going to say it's not. They're going to say it's not. This is good. They're going to say it's not meaningless because we get to define what our meaning is. It's meaningful to me. Who are you to tell me what's meaningful? They are the only ones that are. They define what's meaningful. To which I'm going to say, it is them. It is them. That's right. They're the measure of meaning. That's right. To which I'm going to say, and Hitler defined meaning for the Nazis. In other words, that, well, that's different. Well, he should have done that. Why not? That's where that's morality. We'll talk a lot about morality later on. But at least they're being consistent. Good. Thanks.